readers, reviewers, countrymen, lend us your ears. <laughs>
life society yeah. I'm not saying that london below in this isn't real um, <laughs> it's just that i haven't been there yet it really um, is. and so all sorts of magical creatures are alive but they are hidden within london and that concept is something that we really have seen before with Rivers of London, Ben Roche's Rivers of London, and Harry Potter, uh, the muggles who don't know about the magical world, but it never gets old, does no, it? No, no. Um, and again, we see it in Everywhere, and this is just such a creative story that I absolutely adore. And my number nine pick is The Prowl Beast by Robert Lowe. Now, recently, um, Robert Lowe, the great historical fiction writer and the Viking reenactor, actually passed away. Um, I saw a really touching post by Giles Christian on the internet about it. Um, but Robert Lowe has been one of my favourite authors for a long, long time now. Um, I binged the Oathsworn series, which this is book four of. So this is the final book of the Oathsworn um, quartet. Uh, there is a fifth book afterwards where it goes to new char characters in a fresh environment. But this is just the pinnacle of historical fiction writing, in my opinion. Um, it's so authentic to uh, Viking Age characters. It's got all of those details that a reenactor would love to read. Obviously, I'm all a geek about the swords and the <laughs> beards and the, the ring mail and all the, um, or, you know, all of the whole mythology, the Norse pantheon and Kvass's blood and mead and all that stuff. Anyway, um, you can see Robert Lowe here has a grasp of how uh, Vikings would actually act, you know, how they how they would speak, how they would um, be with each other, their camaraderie. The beginning of this book had me in tears uh, in I was just so worried for the characters and I hadn't felt like that for such a long time since I probably read one of dad's books. Um, and uh, it sweeps you off and they take you on journeys in places you haven't seen before in Viking fiction, um, you know, such as looking for Attila the Hun's burial chambers oh, so awesome, across the steppe in, uh, in Eastern Europe and uh, in Asia as well. And they take you all down to Sark uh, Sarkland, I think it is, um, and then to Miklagard and through Africa and all this kind of stuff. And the Prowl Beast, it just has everything amazing that the Oathsworn has in it. So this uh, series tells the story of Orm, the Bear Slayer, um, it starts with the whale road when he is a young, very young boy, um, and then it goes all the way through to the prow beast uh, when he is an older man and a jarl uh, in charge of a group of, of mercenaries um, living in Scandinavia. And they get up to all sorts of mischief. Um, there's a bond between these men that is unbreakable. They all do awful things. They also do very brave and very heroic things. Um, and it really, if you are a fan of Grimdark, this is up your, will be definitely up your street. If you like Vikings or the, the Last Kingdom, then this is just the next level from Bernard Cornwell, uh, in my opinion. And I think it's one of the greatest series uh, of all time. And my ninth pick is To Kill a Mockingbird by the one and only Harper Lee. Although I'm sure some other people have that name. <laughs> but just the Harper Lee wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. Well, where, where to start? Obviously, this is one of the most renowned works of fiction of the last century. Yeah. And I would say it deserves to be so and higher recommended as well. It's weird. I think sometimes when books are so highly recommended that they sometimes drop from people's lists mm. because it's almost like they're discussed too much, which is a shame because To Kill Mockingbird is one of the greatest books that I have ever it's like read. It's like songs on the radio. When you hear when you hear it so much, it's like, OK, this yeah. was good. Now I'm sick of it. Yeah. It's like uh, my alarm to get up in the morning is that song from Guns N' Galaxy. Mr. Blue Sky. Mr. Blue Sky. <laughs> so I used to love it. So I thought I would make this my alarm. This will make me jolly. I cannot stand <laughs> them. What, the electronic orchestra? Oh, hate them. Awful. OK, we've digressed. We've <laughs> Sorry. digressed a bit. Um, uh, back to To Kill Mockingbird. I think that <laughs> this is such a compelling story that not only does it convey such strong and powerful and meaningful didactic messages but the prose is just fantastic and also Harper Lee in this creates some of the most wonderful characters to grace the page from Atticus Finch the lawyer who is just outstanding mm. in so many memorable moments to our main protagonist Scout these are characters that I will never forget their key moments if, if I never read this again Sorry about Edith barring in the background. She's making she's a like, yeah, I love it. <laughs> she's making a presence known in all our videos now. Mm -hmm. But Scout and Atticus Finch and so many more, they are characters that are just, they really are one of a kind. And I don't know how Harper Lee managed to just bring everything together to such a perfect book. So that is why To Kill Mockingbird, it takes, clinches the ninth spot on my list. 
Uh, and my next pick is it number eight now? It is. On to yeah. eight already is Shogun by James Clavell. Um, now, boy, this is a phenomenal book. Um, uh, it is a tale about Japan. Um, the year is 1600. Uh, John Blackthorne has just washed up on the Japanese coast uh, and it is teeming with samurai. Now, this is at the height of, I think, the Catholic and the Protestant War between the Spanish and the English and the Portuguese. Yeah. They're all rushing to get trade agreements and negotiations with Japan because it was fairly um, new for the um, white Westerners. Mm -hmm. um, now, what I love about this is that it doesn't feel like it's, it's been whitewashed. This is all about a society that... Um, isn't really written about all too much. You know, trying to find a um, a decent historical fiction uh, about Japan is really actually quite tricky, um, unless you find something actually written by um, by someone who's Japanese in Japan as well. You know, that kind of thing. In uh, actually in the language, things that have been translated. Yeah. Now, James Clavell. I mean, it's it's an absolute monster of a tome. It's about a thousand <laughs> pages. And what I love is and it's worth it, yeah, James. it really is. John Blackthorne is. It's not like Kavoth, you know, like Kavoth is amazing at everything. Although yeah. I like that, but also um, this here feels like when John Blackthorne washes up on the beach of Japan, he is basically like a baby to them. Like he can't, you know, he cannot fight. He cannot, has no grasp of the language. He really has nothing to defend himself with. Yeah. It's not like he has a, you know, where Westerners have the guns, you know, and that's how they defeat the savages and all this kind of stuff. It's nothing like that at all. Now, this is closer to literary fiction, really, than historical fiction, to be honest. Um, the way it's written, the prose is stunning. It's breathtaking at times. And the culture that James Clavell was writing about is so rich and authentic and unique that it, it just made me fall in love with the whole idea of Japan. Now, I don't know how historically authentic it is but you know to get me feeling some way about uh, the country of japan um how beautiful and how brutally violent and aggressive and and um and at times wonderful it is you know is actually quite a, a good job by an author in my yeah. opinion you know um and the story is just phenomenal there are characters here that you hate the characters you love characters you love to hate it's got everything in a book that you'd want to read um, and it also has katanas, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, there are some set pieces here that are probably some of the best I've ever read, you know, proper um, George R. R. Martin um, worthy, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Um, they are brutal, there are betrayals. The only disappointment is the very ending. Um, I won't go into it, but apart from that, it is, you know, one of the best books ever. And I think, um, so many people more should be reading this right now. I don't really see this on too many people's lists. I see that Patrick actually wants to read this soon. Um, and But I just think it's such a good book. I read it when I was about 16, 17, and it really captured my imagination. And I'm definitely going to be rereading this soon. Um, hopefully we can do it together, Will. That'd be read it awesome, before. buddy. Read. Um, I think you would absolutely love it. It's got so many layers as well. Um, and you're always thinking, it's like Shrek, and you're always thinking what's going to happen it next. Again. It is a page turner. For a book that's a thousand pages long, um, that's really important, I think. But Shogun is my number eight pick. It's a beautiful pick, um, lovely cover, amazing book, uh, one that I will that will stick with me forever. And my number eight spot is a book that I recently managed to convince Ed to read. I've been grinding him down for the last year and he got round to it. Mm. Whispering and in my ear at it. night. And it is. Oh, make me a sandwich <laughs> and read Rage of Dragons. <laughs> it is The Rage of Dragons by Evan Winter. This is a military fantasy yes. first instalment to The Burning. It is essentially a tale of vengeance. And. He got that right. I mean, we love tales of vengeance. So <laughs> there's just something about them, like, look at Gladiator, the film. Yes. You will just. You instantly feel the momentum of the story and the gravitas, don't you? Yeah. And this in the intimate nature of stories such as this and Gladiator. I think that's something that Evan Winter does to make it so different is that somehow in his project, without reminding you of why Tao has this quest for vengeance every single page, he managed to just execute it like subtextually, you know the whole time you feel his anger in every action yeah, he does. And his mind is his, so focused, isn't it? On... I know i think it is it's it all it does question a lot of whether vengeance is worth it and it shows that Tao, you love him as a character, but he does a lot of bad things to those around him because he is so just focused on this one mission. So it's not only a tale of vengeance, but as a tale of those who are caught in the midst of such 
passion. Mm. And I think that Evan Winter, he somehow manages to make you feel the tension, the suspense, the anger. And throughout this whole story, this overarching sense of dread the entire time that you feel as Tao overcomes one obstacle, the next one that is even bigger presents itself. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how is he going to do this? And I was so emotionally engaged with Tao and his companions. I thought it was wonderful. There's a camaraderie he has with someone in a section that is related to Gladiator a bit. And the Gladiator rings, but teams. Yes, yeah, and I that, love that section. They are, that is one of the best sections of any book that mm. I've ever read, just because of the relationship you have with those characters. And it was such a compelling and captivating read. And that, it really keeps you on the edge of your seat, and it takes it in directions you really didn't think that's it would exactly go. what i was going to say it ends in a conclusion that you never would have expected but it's not a scapegoat it results in something bigger than you're expecting yeah. and it really leads on to the next installment as well so the rage of dragons my eighth pick for my top 10 books ever and my eighth pick is the sun by philip meyer now you know earlier when i said i'm a very impressionable young man i once upon a time read the pale horseman and I was out there pretending I was Uhtred, wasn't I? Yeah, method I was, acting. Absolutely, yeah, method acting. I am the you next full Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, absolutely. And now, when I read The Sun, I immediately had um, a complete fascination with the Native American culture of the Comanches. Now, um, it was an awakening that has actually It changed. really was. It's genuinely changed your life. Yeah, we can say that about quite a few things. We'll say that about another book later on. I mean, if you've watched um, some of our other videos on our uh, monthly reads, you'll see how many non-fiction and fiction that Ed has read to do with the Comanches. Yes. And that was all It all started with this. It really did. And there was a few books here that I'll talk about that kind of kick-started this. But this kind of helped my love of the Westerns grow and then also put me into new territory um, with the Comanches. Now, the Comanches were a Native American band um, living, obviously, in Native America... In, in America, sorry, in the Americas, um, all the way from... Um, near Canada, I think Montana, uh, on the Great Plain, all the way down to New Mexico and also Mexico. Um, now, The Sun is a book of three timelines and it tells the story of Texas. It, still, it tells the story of the state. Um, and it begins with a point of view called Eli McCullough. Um, and he is living in the early 19th century, around the 1830s, I believe. Um, that's when his timeline is focused. And then the second point of view is his son, Peter, um, later on, right at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. And then it goes to um, Eli's granddaughter, Jeannie, uh, and she is around World War II, that kind of era. Um, Can I ask and, a question? Is it, of course. Or do all three sections run parallel? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so you've got one from Eli, one from Peter, one from Jeannie. It goes through all the way like that. And... I've read this twice now. The storyline I was hit with for the first time was the Comanche story with Eli, where Eli is actually a white settler in Texas, um, and he is then captured by a native uh, by a Comanche band. And what they would do is, if a young boy was young enough, if he in between you know seven years old to about twelve, then he was the perfect age to kind of induct into their band because they had to bolster their numbers. Um, you know, they were getting uh, attacked by rangers, um, killed off by cholera, that kind of thing. Um, so the Comanches decided that basically, you know, it wasn't all about whether you're white, you know, what colour skin you have. It's about having people to be part of the people, because that's what the Comanches called themselves, the people. Now, this really did awaken something in me. It's a beautiful book. Um, the way Philip Meyer writes, people were saying that he is kind of the next Cormac McCarthy. He's only written two books, but the way he writes is breathtaking um, and also really quite violent all at once, very similar to Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy, which I'll be speaking about a little bit later on. Um, spoilers. Spoilers, it is a spoiler. But, um, so The Sun has those three interweaving plots, and what Philip Meyer does so well is makes you immediately connect with the characters, and even though you really don't like any of them, they just feel so real, and it feels like you're reading a history book. 
um, that has, is just so vivid and so luscious with detail. And and here you can really feel that Philip Meyer gets the details right. You know, he, he write, basically writes a whole chapter about what the Comanches would use all of the different parts of a buffalo for. And he he, he knew that because uh, he went and met people um, who were had had Comanche blood in, in them. Uh, and he actually went and lived with them and did many, many activities that they would have done um, back in the time of the 19th century. Now, it really is uh, a, a staggering work and it does tell, tell a really nice tale of Texas. Not nice, it's bloody uh, and it's a very violent history, but I, I felt like my eyes had really been opened. I'd never really thought of the history um, of what had actually gone on. And it also talks about um, the Americans' longest war they ever fought, which was against the Comanches, about a 40 year war against them. Um, and uh, which is the longest war they've ever fought against anyone. So it, it is quite breathtaking. Uh, and like I said, it just changed something in me. It made me feel like I need to go research so much more about them. I even started writing my own book uh, about fantasy, a book inspired by this. So it really has definitely affected me. But I'd recommend this if you like Westerns, if you like historical fiction, um, if you just like good writing, if you like literary fiction, there's really, really amazing anecdotes here and, a nice, and a, basically just a fantastic commentary on life in general with uh, the way life is changing, but, you know, modernism uh, and all aspects aspects of that with technology and the way people change, the way people are, money, greed, power. There's just a commentary on nearly every aspect of human life here uh, and that's why I enjoyed it so much. And my seventh choice is Lancelot by Giles Christian. I mean alongside Lord of the Rings from such a young age I discovered the Arthurian legend and all the perspectives, angles, dimensions you can look at the Arthurian legend. I've just fallen in love with it and it's been one of those constant passions that I'm lucky to have discovered at a young age that I still carry with me now. And you've always wanted to be Lancelot, haven't you? <laughs> I, I, until I read Bernard Cornwell, but we, we might <laughs> yeah. talk about that a bit later. But I think that Giles Christian, he perfectly encaps encapsulates what I love about the Arthurian legend. He takes a historical focus of Arthur, the potential that maybe he was real, maybe he was a chieftain shortly after the Romans left. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Um, so he takes that perspective, but he does it from Lancelot. It's a bit like the idea that Joan M. Harris had writing the Gospel of Loki, uh, Norse mythology, from Loki's perspective. I mean, it's just genius, isn't mm. it? Lancelot is often a hero, but he's a tragic hero. Giles Christian perfectly encapsulates what I love about the Arthurian legend. He takes that historical foundation, the basis where Arthur may have been around as Maybe. a chieftain shortly after the Romans left. Maybe. But he keeps that, not the romanticism, because that can sometimes be too much, but that romantic aspect of camaraderie, brotherhood, of friendship and... Real heartbreak. It, it's tragic. Yeah, it's, this it is, is a tragic it, story. Yeah. I, the thing about the Arthurian legend, it is driven by love. Love for friends and... Lovers. Lovers <laughs> as well. <laughs> I was trying to find the word. Romans, thanks, thanks, thanks. <laughs> Lend me your ears. And Giles Christian does so in such a different way. I think at the time we live in, there's so many different takes on Arthur, from adaptations to the screen to books as well. And so sometimes it can become a bit more stale because we've seen it done so many times. But Giles Christian totally does not do that. It is a wonderful, wonderful story. I think it was actually the first book I listened to on Audible as well. That's so great. that's oh, a great maybe, book too. Maybe something else was slightly more sentimental mm. to me as well. And I love this story so, so much. This is historical fiction at its best. And honestly, if you have not read this before, any of Giles Christian's works, it is filled with lyrical prose magnificent characters a fantastic plot and just a really fresh take on arthur so please do give this a go this is my seventh pick for this list and now we're getting in, into the even heavier hitters uh with joe crombie's the last argument of kings um now just straight away the title was phenomenal uh this is a beautiful book um that is just full of bloody war hilarious characters uh, and a whole lot of torturers. Um, now, Joe Abercrombie's writing is 
phenomenal. It, it, it's um, it, it's just in the the upper echelons of, of any author ever, in my opinion. The way he has a turn of phrase, the way he structures his chapters, the way he introduces characters at this perfect point, the way he has focal points um, within his writing on certain aspects, themes, and uh, what's it? motifs. There you go. No. Um, now, you don't just need that to be a great storyteller. What you need is some really unique characters and the Logan Nine Fingers, one of you know basically Conan with a with a heart, um, and then you've got Jezel, the beautiful coward, um, which is just genius, uh, and then you've got uh, Glockter, who is a torturer. Now, straight away you can see just from that they're very individual. But Joe Abercrombie has such a way with characters that any character he writes, whether it's for a sentence, a chapter, or an entire book, um, he completely makes them their own. He completely makes them real, and he turns them from, you know, just another fantasy book into one of the best pieces of writing of all time. Uh, now, this book is the third book in the First Law trilogy, and um, it really finishes with a bang. Uh, and what I love is how surprised I was. I'd read, it, uh, and to be fair, I haven't writ read that much traditional fantasy in my life. I think lots of other people were even more shocked when this first came out because it wasn't really the trend back when the first law came out to be a bit more grim dark, a bit more grim in just in general, um, to have to, to surprise readers in such a way that such He's really acting George R. R. Martin, this, yeah, for... well, George R. Martin, I think he said was uh, Joe Abercrombie said George R. R. Martin was such a big influence on him. Yeah. You know, if you know of the Red Wedding, then you know of the brutal surprises that Mr. Martin is capable of, and Joe Abercrombie is no exception. Um, what I love is how uh, just real everything feels. It all things authentic to the characters and the world, uh, and it's so gritty. It you know it, it it reminds me of Larry McMurtry's writing, but you know ramped up even higher. The humour in this book is just brilliant. It's it's laugh out loud funny, and also you feel bad for laughing most of the time because what the people are doing is awful. What you're laughing about is awful, uh, and that makes it even funnier in my opinion. Um, Jabba Comey has such a way with humour, but also doesn't take detract from any of the really hard hitting moments. Mm. Sounds um, a bit like what I was talking about with Richard the Third yeah, a few videos ago. Absolutely, <laughs> really does. Um, it's got it's got everything, but it's got such a perfect balance. Uh, the action, Jabba Comey writes some of the best action in fantasy. Um, it's so visceral and so to the point, uh, pardon the pun, um, that I just absolutely love it. You can't help but get sucked into it. Uh, and, you know, his turn with characters is just, it's just genius. It really is. You know, you read this and you think, how can anyone even write this, especially for a first trilogy? Uh, but The Last Argument in Kings is probably my favourite Joe Abercrombie book that I've read so far. Um, unfortunately, we weren't allowed to have more than two books, and more than one book, sorry, uh, on this list um, for the same author. We have made one exception. I'm sure you'll understand later on. But uh, this is my favourite Joe Abercrombie. I think The Heroes is probably a close second. Um, but it's absolutely brilliant. These has fantastic characters, and if you want to read fantasy, this should be at the top uh, of your list. And now for my six, 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 six. Yes. my sixth choice on this list, and it is normal people. <laughs> We've only got nine. Okay, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> we have already got nine. <laughs> Maybe we'll have Gollum sit with us when we do this video next. No, time. precious, don't okay. do it. Gollum, you're banished. I sound like Gurgi actually. Gurgi, yeah, from the Black Cauldron. Mountains and crunches must be in her somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, we anyway, uh, we get so easily distracted. I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> Sorry, the sixth choice on my list it's a bit hot for all this i can't keep track of you right now is normal people by sally rooney this is a wonderful compelling contemporary story that is really driven by character relationships when i started reading this i i was just blown away by how natural and organic the dialogue and interactions between characters are this is quite an episodic story that follows Connell, I think that's what he said the name, Connell and um, uh, Marianne through their formative years, their older formative years, through college and through university. And they are sometimes together, they break apart their friendship and it is heartbreaking and tragic but heartwarming as well. And it's really about growing into adulthood and how people change and how everyone has 
so many problems facing them in their life, so many obstacles mm -hmm. to overcome, and you to get over them or to conquer them, you have to have friends and people there for you. You can't do it on your own. Wise words. And it is. Yeah, nice words. I deep. can't. I can't really take credit for that. Sadly. <laughs> Um, and it's so beautiful how it's executed. I think when messages such as that are at the core of a story, it can sometimes come across a bit rushed, especially when you think these are words on a page and you are restricted by the page count. But Sally Rooney does it in such a way, in such a way where it is so organic. And I just love how this book unfolds and it really just took me by surprise by how much I love this. I also love the adaptation. I think the main actor for who acts Connell um, actually won the BAFTA for Best Actor recently. Wow. So yeah. um, it's a great programme as well. And if you've not read Normal People, even if, if this isn't really your normal cup of tea or cup of anything, um, please do try this out because Normal People is a beautiful, breathtaking, I'm stealing your word now, uh, breathtaking story. And for my fifth pick, uh, this is Lonesome Dove. Uh, Lonesome Dove is my probably my favourite Western, well it is because this is the top Western um, officially on my list. Now, I recently read this, but there's no recency bias here. As soon as I read the first page, I knew this would be on my, on my top 10 list. And Lonesome Dove is just one of the greatest works of art of all time. It's, it's basically the Odyssey, but in the Wild West. Um, it is a, a tale of how um, a group of veteran Texas Rangers get together a castle company and they become the first people to drive castle all the way from Texas all the way up to Montana. Um, now along the way um, it is hilarious how it begins that you know they meet really funny characters and uh, they get the band together uh, they are just living normal lives and each you know the Larry Mercury blends with POV so fluidly that you're not really sure who the story is being told from but you see everyone's point of view uh, all at once. In Joe Abercrombie's words this starts off as a comedy and it ends well and truly as a tragedy. Now I completely wholeheartedly agree. Um, this had me weeping towards the end. There are characters that you connect with so much um, that it, and it is life, you know, and Lonesome Dove um, tells the story of their lives. It, it, it's about two um, old Texas Rangers. One is called Woodrow McCall and the other is called Augustus McRae. Now, the order that I read the Lonesome Dove series in is that I didn't go chronologically because this was the first book written. I actually went, um, not sorry, not chronological. I went chronologically... But not the order is published. That's the one. There we go. We got there. So I started with Dead Team Man's one. Walk, which is when the, t um, the two Texas Rangers were actually young boys, so about 16, 17 years old, joining the Texas Rangers. Then I read Comanche Moon, which about 10, 15, 20 years later, and then Lonesome Dove, about another 10, 20 years later. Um, and uh, I just love how each person has a moment to shine. They all have their quirks. They all have their very unique aspects. They all have aspects about them that aren't as likable. They all feel so real and human, very similar to Joe Abercrombie's characters. Um, and they all do things that you can completely empathize with, no matter who they are. Um, there are really heartbreaking moments. There are moments that make you laugh so much. And the humor in this is just brilliant. It's so direct. And it's just, again, a pragmatic humor. Uh, Larry Murtry's descriptions are wonderful and it, I think it's nearly a thousand pages again uh, and the way you can connect it's chunky with, books it really is you. proper chunky but very funky um, it, just the way you connect with these characters is, is such a testament to Larry Murtry's skill um, that he can really get you feeling that way about any of these characters now this is my favourite western if you're ever going to read a western please choose this one uh, because it will sweep you off your feet take you to 19th century America and you will feel the warmth of the Texas desert and also the cold of the Montana winter and now for the last book that we'll be talking about in this video so the first part of our top 10 yep because we do like to hark on about our favourite books so we don't want us to be too long and this is Enemy of God by Bernard Cornwell. The big the man BC. Himself. And this is the second instalment in the Warlord Chronicles. You know, earlier I talked about my love of Arthurian legend and I love Lance a lot. Well, here we have it again. This is another Arthurian retelling. This is actually a lovely hard that copy I've stolen from Papa Gwyn. Borrowed. 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 Jinx. Jinx again. We finish each other's sentences. Yeah, if you finish my sandwich. 
Ed will get very angry. He's like, Jeremy why are you to punch you on the nose? Jerry does not <laughs> share food. Ed does not share food. But anyway, more importantly, more we yes. share books. We share books. But Enemy of God is absolutely just glorious. It is, like Lancelot, it takes a historical bedrock, a foundation. It is, a, it is historical fiction. But Bernard Cornwall, as you know, if you've read any of his sharp books or anything from the Saxon stories, The Last Kingdom, he's got this way of telling a story and allowing it to unfold that it is so natural and organic, but it fulfills your need as a reader mm. for something, for it to build into something bigger. And Enemy of God, the middle instalment, is something that really achieves that. I think that's something that really makes this different from our other Arthurian tellings is that where Lancelot goes from the perspective of surprise surprise Lancelot this goes from the unique perspective of Derval who is just just the nicest person isn't he <laughs> I mean he's fallible like all human beings and he does make grave mistakes <laughs> I and wish I knew what fallible men but it really doesn't sound like it's oh, a you quality know, it, you it, want it, person <laughs> anyway, so he has his vices he has <laughs> what are you laughing at now he he does make mistakes and he can sometimes okay. he can sometimes hold a grudge. I mean, like, can't he? <laughs> but he's great he at DT. <laughs> stop it! Do not disrespect. Derby. Sorry, no, I wouldn't. He's I actually I, would, I have to say it. Bernard Cornwell responded to my email once about Arthurian legend, and he said that his inspiration oh, look, for Devil. <laughs> He said his inspiration for Devil was he was actually in some of the original Arthurian tellings by oh, the okay. Welsh monks. Nice. So he went back to the roots, yeah. which I love, um, and he brought Devil back. And I, he's just perfect for the tone and atmosphere that Bernard Cornwell strives for and achieves in this story. It is heartbreaking, again, as I've said with so many of these, they are compelling stories that really you feel attached and engaged with these characters. And... It is again a story of how far you should go for friendship mm -hmm. and the importance of friendship again and family and this is a story that has action, it has fantastic dialogue, it has yeah, amazing serious key themes that Bernard Cornwell lends a, a gravitas to and this is a wonderful retelling of the Arthurian legend that it does strip away much for the rom romanticism of Arthurian legend um, but not in a bad way, it still leaves that foundation of camaraderie that mm -hmm. we love. And so for my second piece of our, um, of Arthurian legend that I am having on this list, it is Enemy of God by Bernard Cornwell. Thank you for watching the first part of our top 10 books ever video. It's been quite hot, so it's taken us a while to get through it. I think my speech has slowed down and mm -hmm. I've got further into this. I like I'm in the I, desert. But I think that talking about some of our favourite books really has invigorated us. Um, it's just really made me want to read them all again. Um, so really looking forward to recording the second part of this. We'll release it a few days after you're seeing this. And so farewell for now. Truth and courage. The Brothers Gwyn. Here endeth the video. <laughs> Stay safe. The Truth Brothers Gwyn. Oh, clashed a bit then. The Brothers Gwyn. The Clash of the Titans. The Ed and Will. Gwyn. Stop talking. <laughs> what I'm saying, the Brothers Gwyn. You stupid fucking hobbit. The, the Brothers, Brothers Gwyn. Gwyn.